what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel and now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless of course your taste level is lacking and if that's the thing with you it's not a thing with me so i can't help with that can't relate y'all i had on a nice you know a nice little silky satin roll which is my signature but it's hotter than the devil's gooch up in here and so i had to take that off i had to take it right on off okay i was there malfunctioning getting the names wrong mm -mm. so i'm back in the better okay y'all today's story there's a lot to unpack per usual i feel like it's always i always say that it's always a lot to unpack right i don't always say like oh I just i can't wait to, to hear your comments down below and get your feedback yo this case and the one i did earlier in the week i might just host a live so i can talk to y'all in real time and we can discuss the things because why now i do want to give a disclaimer with today's case that i am struggling to find photos of the four men that i'm going to be talking about today after i film this i'm gonna go back in and look again dig deeper for photos but it has been very difficult to find pictures of all four of them so i just want to get that out the way just in case i don't have photos of everybody and i have to get creative that's why so without further ado let's get into what we are here to talk about today now what what I'm discussing today transpired between four friends, four male friends, and this all happened in 2004. Now we have Ivy Keys, David Mason, Jason Fisher, and Josiah Therno, all of which between the ages of 19 and 23, all of which do a lot of meth okay we going right in with it today now david is the oldest of the friend group he is 23 the others are 19 and 20. david has served in the u.s army but had gotten into some kind of trouble that resulted in him being dishonorably discharged now whatever the reason for the discharge is not public information but it was definitely dishonorable they sent him home with shame upon his family. And after returning home, his trouble had continued. In 2003, shortly after returning home from the army, he had caught a fourth degree theft charge and was fined and given the option to service his community as opposed to serving time in jail. But despite being the oldest of this crew, his criminal record is not as extensive as his younger cohorts. Now, Jason Fisher is just 19, but he is the ringleader of the group and their resident carjacker. In 2002, at just 17 years old, Jason was charged with four counts of car theft, which he had just received probation for, partly due to his age. And while on probation, Jason fails six drug tests before they order him to seek treatment for addiction, which he does not, and does he face any repercussions for not, following say a court order no and his little bit of probation ends the year after it had begun the very next year after his probation was up state troopers find him and a friend just casually chilling alongside a car that had been recently set on fire and like burned to a crisp police search the vehicle that the two guys are in they find two sawed off shotguns a double-edged dagger an automatic pistol and the devil's lettuce child both men are arrested and charged accordingly jason again avoids jail time and is instead placed on probation again and then we have 20 year old josiah who also has somewhat of an extensive criminal background at his very young age now josiah had graduated high school he had made it all that way without getting into trouble but child trouble came immediately after that october 2nd of 2003 he was arrested for six counts of forgery but he was back on the streets at the top of the new year and y'all new year same josiah january 19th literally just a couple of weeks after his release he was charged with second degree burglary he was not arrested and just two days after this he gets himself a nasty little dui for which he serves just a couple of days in jail his punishment for this is ultimately just community service and with all he got going on all of this trouble he is in he manages to always just get by with either doing house arrest probation or community service sometimes a pairing of two and some of his charges are even dismissed the fourth and final member of the group is 19 year old ivy ivy's background is not as extensive as everyone else in the group but make no mistake he didn't got into trouble too june 17th of 2003 he 
and Jason were arrested for assaulting a 17 year old girl and it was fourth degree assault which in Alaska is defined as recklessly causing physical injury to another person with criminal negligence or placing another person in fear of physical injury through the use of words or other conduct. So I'm not exactly sure what they had done to the young lady, but I wanted to make that clear because when we hear assault um, in certain contexts, we always typically think of SA, but that was not the case. And now that I've given you a little bit of background, let me tell you about what went down. Bars. I say bars for the girls who, who missed that, okay? I heard y'all. I saw y'all miss it. Now, Jason, he has been using hard drugs. And when I say hard drugs, I mean meth since he was 14 years old. And by now, all four of them use. On May 13th, the four of them get into the car and they are riding down Steve's Highway, all four of them on a binge that had begun days prior. And all four of them been high the entire time. They drive about 40 miles before turning off on this road that is marked with a no trespassing sign. And apparently there is something going on with the car stereo. Josiah and David, they're working on the car. Meanwhile, Ivy and Jason go off for a short walk. When they return to the car, Avi hands David a cigarette, which he then puts into his mouth. But before he can even light it, Jason walks up behind him and shoots him in the head twice. He then proceeds to ask David, are you dead yet? And asks a second time because obviously David does not give an answer. Avi and Josiah are both in complete shock and whether out of fear or in their messy little days when Jason pulls a set of knives and an axe from the trunk of the car and tells them that he wants the remains chopped up into pieces so that they'll sink when he throws them in the river which is what they were going to do next. Child they don't ask any questions they fall right in line and get to doing the thing. And in the midst of doing this Jason takes a knife and removes a tattooed portion of skin from David commenting about how he had always liked the tattoo and would like to keep it and together the friend group removes his arms his legs cuts the torso in half and removes the head while removing the head Jason decides that he wants to keep David's pierced ear as well and he tells them he has plans of putting it into a little jar of liquid and keeping it as a treasure then the various parts of this man are loaded into the trunk of the car and the group of guys head toward the nearest river when they get to the river though Jason decides that not only does he want to keep the ear and the tattoo he wants to keep the head as well so everything else is thrown into the river and he was right everything sank and that's not a tip for you to use later on in your life i'm just telling you what happened with them afterward the guys go home and continue life as if nothing ever happened they also continue their binge and at this point they probably needed to now two days later May 15th at about 1 a.m. Alaska State Troopers spot a car driving erratically swerving in and out of lanes and of course they go to pull the car over. It is Ivy driving Jason's car and Jason is on the passenger side seat. The car also does not have a front license plate and when officers go to pull the car over instead of stopping Ivy floors it. As soon as he see those blue lights come on in their rearview mirror he is out of there. He runs a stop sign he runs several red lights he is weaving in and out of lanes like this is gta at this point i'm not quite sure that it's not he is going at least 90 for most of the chase and eventually police have to stop pursuing him out of fear that it'll cause an accident and they're not trying to harm a civilian who ain't got anything to do with any of the things so instead they call for backup who are then able to block off an intersection ahead of the direction that ivy is going they lay down spike strips ivy runs clean over the spike strips blowing out the front two tires of the car but did you think he stopped no he kept going it was real ghetto now the car does eventually get tired and get out on him when it does both men hop out and take off on foot of course they separate because job the police catch up to them they don't want to make it easy for them to get a two for one police spot ivy standing on the side of the road but when they approach him he lies and pretends like he is a hitchhiker he don't know anything about a high speed chase but they are sure that he is the guy now when they arrest him he switches his tone and he tells them okay 
I was in that car, but I was not the driver. I was a passenger in the car and that doesn't work either. They charge him with eluding police, a DUI and third degree criminal mischief. Not only was he high, he had been drinking too. So he was just completely out of it and behind the wheel. They locate the car, they give it a quick once over before having it impounded. Ivy's father comes and bails him out of jail and Ivy tells his father, dad, don't worry if I don't come back for a few days. And next thing he knows, his son is just gone, vanished. When Ivy fails to show up for his court date, a warrant is issued for his arrest and since that day his dad picked him up, no one has heard from him or seen him. Not even his, his dad, his friends nobody and nobody knows why Ivy would go missing because he ain't no stranger to a court date okay it just does not make sense to anyone while he will go missing at least not yet meanwhile David is officially reported missing and it is said that he was last seen getting into Jason's car but unfortunately that is all the information that they have and there is no proof that he had. A little over a month after the high speed chase had gone down, the lot where the car was impounded calls police and tells them that this car they dropped off is starting to smell. There is a very foul odor coming from it that has gotten worse as the weeks go by. When they had initially searched the car, they had not gone into the trunk. So they go back out to the lot, open the trunk, and they are horrified at what they find. The pieces of David that Jason had kept as a trophy that day. They find the jar with the liquid, with the tattooed skin and the pierced ear, the heavily decomposed head. All of this had been in the trunk rotting in the hot summer sun for the past month and a half. Additionally, there are the axes, the knives, all of the things that they used. Why they would not have searched the vehicle once they got worried that David was now missing and last seen getting into Jason's car that they already have possession of is wild. But now they know what has happened to their missing person. Now, so far, all they have is that David is missing he was last seen getting into Jason's car but Ivy was driving Jason's car and Ivy is now missing so they're assuming that this is why Ivy is missing now why he was doing all of this in Jason's car they don't know but they don't release any information to the public because they don't want to tip Jason off just in case he was an accomplice and y'all they would not have to go find Jason with how he get down how he he breaks the law he would surely be coming right into their little view very soon and he does the following month Jason goes to court for that possession charge that he called not long ago and he receives jail time while he is locked up officers question him still very careful not to make him think he is a person of interest they just frame their questions as you know questions that make sense to ask like why he had not picked up his car since it had been impounded so that he tells them that car is not mine i sold the car so whatever has happened to it, it might be registered to me still, but it is no longer mine. They then ask him if he had any idea where David might have gone off to. And to that, he says that he and David were not really friends, that they had met before, but he didn't really know David like that and didn't even know he was missing. Eventually, he is released and it's not long before state troopers are pulling him over again for not having a license plate on the front of his car. They also find him in possession of several weapons and illegal substances. So he gets even more charges added to the ones he already has pending. He goes to trial for these charges on December 21st of 2004 and is sentenced to four years in jail. He is also given a court order to attend rehab and is ordered to undergo a mental health evaluation. Now, just a few months into his sentence, Jay Jason is somehow released into a halfway house, Fairbanks North Star Center to be exact, and he abides by the rules of the halfway house for months but not forever. On June 9th of 2005, Jason signs out of the facility to go on a job search. At least that's what he put his reasoning down as and he does not return. And despite the open investigation surrounding David, they made no real efforts to find 
this man and they made no progress in the case. Now, fast forward three months down the line in September, police receive a tip. Someone informs them that Jason had killed David and they were sure about this. Several weeks later, another person contacts them making the exact same claim. Now, this person says that Jason had been going around town bragging about it. He's admitted to it. He's been making very sick jokes about what they had done with David after the fact. One of the tipsters has never been identified or named and the other is Josiah Therno. On October 12th, they are finally able to track down and arrest Jason. When state troopers just find him walking around town midday, it was like 2 p.m. He was just outside on vibes, not worried about a thing. Now, when he realized the police was zeroing in on him, he did attempt to take off on foot, but they uh they outran him. When they searched his little pockets, he had more weapons and more drugs. They questioned him about David again, and he denies having anything to do with what happened to David. However, he does tell them that he was the passenger in the car during the high speed chase, which up until this point, they didn't even know that there was a passenger to know it was him or think it was him. He also admits to bragging and making jokes about being the person that had done this to David, but he tells them that he just did this to look like a big, bad, tough guy. So nobody around town would mess with him and that it wasn't true. Of course, they don't believe him and he just sits in jail waiting on his court date. Meanwhile, on the outside, the boys are still up to no good. Josiah continues to collect DUIs and traffic violations like sonic rings. He gets banned from going anywhere where alcohol is served and is placed on probation for two years. Now, from what I gather from the case file is that he was able to avoid jail time because by that point they had identified him as their tipster and he was listed as a protected witness. Now, I don't know if that's why he didn't get jail time this time, but he is in fact by this time a protected witness of the state. At the very first hearing for Jason, both the prosecution and the defense team requested the continuation. And at the second hearing, the prosecution drops a bomb when they hint at having spoken to Ivy Keys before he had disappeared on everybody. And this sparks rumors that he was actually in protective custody and not really missing. After hearing this, Jason changes his tune. He goes from saying he wasn't guilty of anything to saying, okay, I let off the first shot, but Ivy let off the second. But according to their witness, Josiah, who was actually there, of course, this is not how things transpired. Jason had indeed acted alone. And before the trial can conclude in the natural order of things, Jason and his lawyer decide to cut a deal with the prosecutors. He'll plead no contest to murder in the second degree and face 10 to 90 years. I don't know how that's a deal, but that's the deal they cut. Jason's mother and his sister come down to the courtroom lying to the people girl on his behalf, saying that Jason was such a good kid and that his character should be strongly considered when deciding his sentence. They said he was nice, that he loved animals, and that things had just gone wrong once he started dabbling in drugs. But I'm trying to see if he started at 14, baby, things went wrong pretty early. Don't you think like all of us were pretty good kids? It's not hard to be good at seven. His mother tells this story that is, according to her, her fondest memory of him. She says that she had gone into labor with his sister unexpectedly. There were no adults at home, just her and little Jason. And he was so strong and fearless, told her, don't worry, I'll drive you to the hospital, even though he was only seven at the time. My girl, he the one that was jacking cars. He probably could have driven you to the hospital. Like, I don't think that was a story that was, that was helpful but she told it. The prosecutor really thought he ate with his rebuttal to the picture they painted of his character. He says, Jason may have been a good kid once who loved animals, but he sure didn't love his fellow man. 
Now, the defense argues that a lot of the blame should be placed on the drug. And when you subtract the drug's responsibility from Jason's responsibility, he really should should only get about 40 years with a chance to parole after 20. Now, toward the end of his sentencing hearing, they ask Jason if he has anything to say, and he does. He reads aloud his prepared statement, and is long, so I'ma read it right off my phone. Uh-uh, where is it? Oh. Standing before this court today, I willingly accept responsibility for my actions that led me to being here. I was out of my mind with meth when the murder happened. I've been up for weeks and was having hallucinations. The meth also made me paranoid, but I cannot blame the meth. What I did was my fault. I know that I have to decide to never take drugs again, especially meth. It has hurt my family, hurt the people. Okay. It has hurt my family, hurt other people, and hurt myself. I understand this. While I've been in jail, I've been going to Reformers Anonymous meetings in jail, and it has helped me understand a lot. Every day, I feel grief and regret for what I have done. I want to apologize, and I want to ask for forgiveness because I don't forgive myself. I want to apologize to everyone involved, especially my mom. I've caused her so much pain. I never meant to be such a disappointment. Thank you. Chill. Now, the judge says that his youth and his lack of violent history showed potential for rehabilitation. However, comma, his actions after the fact are also being considered. And overall, the judge felt compelled to lean more toward the maximum sentence than lean toward the minimum. He sentences Jason to 80 years in prison with an additional two years. I'm sorry, but that extra two just sent me for previous weapons charges that he had racked up well before this. And Jason would be eligible for parole at 48 with good behavior. Now, the following year, Jason had the audacity, the mitigated gall to go back into the people's court and say that his sentence was harsh. He wanted to appeal it. His court date just so happens to fall on the fifth anniversary of David's death date, which I'm pretty sure probably didn't work out in his best interest. I don't I don't see that being helpful. The court expresses that his actions justified a very harsh sentence. They decide to uphold his 82 years. With the case wrapping, Jason now being locked away like he deserved to be. There is still one loose end, one question that has not been answered. Where is Ivy? His father still had not heard from him since that day that he bailed him out of jail and he said not to worry if he didn't come back for a couple days. It has now been a whole year and surely if he was in protective custody like people thought he would have been out now that everything is done. But the police ain't got him and they began to suspect that he was met with foul play. However they literally have nothing to go on. They do assist his loved ones in their efforts to find him but don't and over time their assistance like they're searching for him kind of tapers off. Ivy's father however does not give up his search for his son he continues to follow up on leads literally himself even five years into his disappearance when a tip comes in someone thought that they had spotted ivy working at a hotel near denali national park ivy's father takes the drive up there to check it out himself only to find that the man is not actually his son and doesn't even really look like his son in his opinion this was the last published tip um, of Ivy who has still never been found and his father feels that at this point the best case scenario is that his son had gone into hiding because he knew what was in that trunk and figured that he might be blamed for David's murder so with that he had decided to move away start his life over elsewhere and never look back he's somewhere okay with maybe a family and a nice little job living a low-key life but the father has stated that he unfortunately has a gut feeling that something terrible happened to his son and that was not the case and detectives also said that it's unlikely that he did you know move away and start his life over because typically when people do that they always at some point make contact with their family to let them know either where they are or that they're okay and because Ivy has never done this it isn't like 
likely. I am double-minded when it comes to Ivy. I don't know. I really feel like he might be down in Mexico somewhere, girl. He might be somewhere in Cuba with Tupac. He might be somewhere living a good life, married with children. I don't know. A little mechanic somewhere. I don't know. I think it's possible they did start his life over somewhere and uh, never reached back. Maybe he just went somewhere, girl, pulled his own plug. I have no idea. I wanna know what your thoughts are. Let me know down below in the comments what you think. Like this video if you have not. Share the video with a friend. Don't forget to subscribe if you have not. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. I'm gonna have to go do a, 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 um, a costume change because that robe was hot, okay? I was hotter than the devil's gooch sitting up here. <sighs> Hopefully that's the reason why I was malfunctioning and couldn't get the names right. Tell me you'll never wanna lose me. Now the date is 2000, okay, no, that's not a date, that's a year, baby. Why are you gonna play me like that? I just sprayed my face with something and it's gonna have me looking like that on the internet, well. But had resulted in some kind of trouble that result, how many times I'm gonna say resulted, girl? Police search the vehicle that they are in and they find two shot, two shot off, what? Now for his DUI, his punishment is only just a couple of days in jail no now his punishment for this is just a couple of days where am i getting a couple of days from while we're moving the head jason is it jason yeah who are able to block off an intersection like ahead of the direction of the car that now a little over a month after the high speed chase the lot where the police it's not where the police is located it's where the car is located girl <laughs> a little over a month after this high speed chase that happened the car where not the car the lot why can't i say this a little over a month after the car and he abides by the rules of the hathaway ha hathaway girl what one of the tipsters has never been identified or named. The other is, I forgot to be a name, here I go. From what I gather from the case file, he alluded, eluded, no. From my actions that led me being, I guess I can't read either. Can't talk, can't read. Standing before my, not my court, he ain't got no court. Ah, oh, come on, bro. Uh-uh, that was disrespectful as hell. Not in my own home.